The unusual buildup of Russian troops near eastern Ukraine has drawn fears of an imminent Russian invasion of Ukraine. While strongly denying such claims, Russia has admitted that its relations with US and NATO have approached a dangerous point. Russia has called for immediate talks with US, ahead of which has put forth a, lit, a tough list of demands. These include that NATO deny membership to Ukraine and other ex-Soviet countries and roll back the deployment of troops and weapons from Central and Eastern Europe. US is unlikely to freeze and has announced that it will be coming out with a set of counter demands. If diplomatic talks fail, tensions could quickly escalate. India wants to retain its strategic autonomy and pursue independent relations with, with each of the great powers. But this has become difficult with the resurgence of hostility between the West and Russia. India cannot afford to alienate Russia, its most important defense partner, and especially not when India is dealing with heightened security concerns posed by an increasingly aggressive China. In the past, India has shown understanding towards Russia's concerns in Ukraine, such as by voting against the Western-backed UN resolution in 2020 on human rights violations in Crimea. But many observers point out that India would not be able to easily look away if Russia invades Ukraine, an important trading partner to India. As a leading democracy, India, could, could, India would be expected to condemn the legal occupation of, of fellow democracy and the accompanying human rights violations. More so, India's Western partners would insist on its cooperation. So far, India has tried to remain neutral and call for a constructive dialogue among all stakeholders. However, if the crisis snowballs, India might be pressured into taking a stand. Who will India choose? Its key strategic partner, the US, or its longtime friend, Russia? How can India walk this, this diplomatic tightrope without alienating either side? In this event, Ambassador Tamil Sibbal will discuss with us the diplomatic complexities of this challenging situation for India. Over his 40 years of experience um, in, in, excuse me, sorry, apologies. Over his 40 years of experience in diplomacy, Kamal Sibbal has served as the former foreign secretary to the government of India and has been ambassador to Russia, Turkey, Egypt, and France. He's on the board of New York-based East-West Institute and a member of Executive Council of Vivekanand International Foundation. He's an advisor to the U.S.-India Strategic Partnership Forum. He's, he's also the chairman of the Forum of Strategic and Security um, Studies. He's, he's an editorial consultant to the Indian Defense Review and is the foreign affairs editor of Post. In 2017, the government of India awarded him with Padma Shri for his distinguished services in the field of public affairs. He has been decorated by the Russian Foreign Ministry for the contributions to international cooperation. We are, so we are honored to have you on our platform. Welcome to Argumentative. Thank you very much. Um, so, so as I outline the situation, the way it's developed, evolving, we would love to know your view on how, um, what, what it means for India and how India is likely to navigate this tough diplomatic situation. Well, I think uh, in order to understand uh, what position India might or might not take, uh, to have a clearer understanding of uh, what would actually determine India's position would not simply be any potential Russia Russian military action against Ukraine, but the whole history of why there is a crisis in Ukraine. Uh, and the roots of the crisis, as everybody knows, goes back to the collapse of the uh, Soviet Union. It just so happens that the constitution of the Soviet Union uh, uh, had in its uh, provisions the right of the constituent states of the Soviet Union uh, to secede. And it, as it happens, Ukraine was a uh, member of the UN uh, separately uh, from, from, from Russia. Uh, now, when the Soviet Union collapsed in uh, 1991, uh, Yeltsin, uh, and this I know since I've been ambassador to Russia, so I have been looked into this a little bit. He actually is to all the constituent states to grab as much independence as they could. Uh, 
Kravchuk, uh, who was the first president uh, of Ukraine, was actually surprised when Yeltsin didn't ask him uh, for the return of Crimea. Uh, Kravchuk was ready to give back Crimea to Russia, but Yeltsin didn't make any such, uh, such demand. Uh, and, and the reason for this is that, uh, that uh, Crimea was not originally uh, a part of uh, Ukraine. Uh, it was made part of Ukraine in 1954 uh, by Khrushchev. And there is some debate uh, about uh, the constitutionality of that decision. Now, you must understand that uh, the Soviet Union was one entity and the Communist Party was controlling the entire country. Uh, and there were com Communist Party units in every part uh, of the constituent uh, states. Uh, so it would be if, let's say, India made some internal changes uh, within its own territory. And later, if some reason parts of India broke up, then some territories that were given uh, to a particular constituent state for whatever reason, but, uh, but were questionable, uh, would be a situation would be similar uh, to what happened within one country when, when all parts of it were, uh, were uh, belonging to one constituent state. The other thing is that the history of Ukraine is very, very complicated. Uh, President uh, Putin has just issued a, a long historical account of relations between uh, the uh, Russian, between Russia and Ukraine, if you like, and how those relations evolved, and how Kiev actually was the uh, uh, the mother of the creation uh, of uh, Rus of the Russian state. I mean, I don't want to go into that. Well, what I meant is that the relations have been extremely, extremely uh, close and intermingled, but but. The borders of this part of uh, Russia originally, or this part of the Soviet Union, have been changing over times. Uh, the western part of Ukraine, today's Ukraine, was part at one time of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, then of the, of the Polish Empire, then of the Lithuanian Empire. And then uh, because it, it was in that sense, uh, it, it had a history of belonging to uh, uh, Western part of Europe, uh, it, and it, it, it became Catholic, unlike uh, the rest of you, Russia or Soviet Union, which was Greek uh, Orthodox. So there is also that problem. And during the Second World War, uh, it is an established fact that uh, the Ukrainian right wing uh, collaborated with the Nazis. So that legacy is also there. And uh, in fact, influences the politics of modern-day uh, Ukraine, the ones that are most hostile to Russia and, uh, and uh, do not want to make any compromise yeah, from the Russian point of view, are precisely these elements uh, who uh, were incorporated into Ukraine but were earlier parts of different empires uh, and, and are, have been collaborators of Nazis and a very uh, right wing. Um, the eastern part of Ukraine, uh, as you know, is uh, uh, Russian speaking. Uh, even if it has some Ukrainians, uh, they're also Russian speaking. So there is a distinct linguistic uh, separation between the western part and the eastern part. Uh, as you well know that when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, before that, uh, when uh, Khrushchev agreed to the reunification of Germany, it was on the clear understanding, although it was not written down in black and white, that uh, NATO will not be extended beyond Germany. But uh, if you look at what happened, uh, NATO has been ceaselessly expanding uh, towards uh, uh, Russia and has already incorporated uh, into the uh, organization, uh, the Baltic states and uh, Poland and Hungary and Romania and some Balkan states, uh, parts of the erstwhile Yugoslavia also. Uh, so in a sense, uh, despite whatever promise had been made from the American and European point of view, uh, the strategy was that uh, Russia should be geopolitically pushed as far back away from Europe 
and create a buffer between Russia and the rest of Europe permanently. Uh, because Russia, even though it's not a highly populated country and in relative terms is economically backward compared to Western Europe, the fact remains it's the largest country in the world. It's got huge spaces, huge natural resources, uh, and it has got a very, very strong military. It has the capacity to defend itself. It's the only country uh, which uh, can stand up to, uh, to the United States uh, and uh, and can destroy the United States. Uh, if, if it comes to it, it will be destroyed itself. It can also destroy the United States. And Europe therefore feels very uncomfortable, especially the newly independent uh, countries of uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Baltic states in particular, and Poland because of historical reasons. They feel very vulnerable. They feel the contiguous pressure of the Russian state. Um, and therefore they are the biggest supporters of the extension of NATO and the presence of the United States in Europe uh, because they rely far more on the security that the United States provides than the European Union can provide because we know the European Union doesn't have much military strength. Uh, you would also remember that uh, uh, part of the policy of uh, uh, spreading democracy uh, around Russia and uh, Potentially, if these interventions became successful and standards of living improved and people got used to freedoms, uh, that it will have a domino effect and will actually bring about a, a real democratic change in Russia itself. This was the whole uh, theory behind these color revolutions. For the first attempt was in Georgia and then in Ukraine, in which the American blatantly interfered. Even the U.S. Assistant Secretary, Victoria Newland, who's now the uh, undersecretary uh, in the State Department, uh, was actually distributing sweets and everything else uh, to the uh, people protesting in, in Maidan, in the Maidan. Uh, so the State Department was uh, very actively involved in this. And the Ukrainian origin community in the United States is pretty strong and, and had, some, uh, had some access uh, to the White House itself. And that explains why uh, also uh, there was a lot of activity in terms of bringing about a democratic change in, uh, in Ukraine. And then uh, Ukraine was promised, uh, uh, or let's say put it this way, that the doors of eventual UN uh, of NATO membership were left open, both for Georgia and for Ukraine. Uh, no decision was taken because I think the West knew it was a very sensitive decision. Uh, but they kept this pressure uh, on Russia, uh, constant pressure on Russia alive uh, by never closing the door and uh, claiming that, not wrongly in terms of principles, that uh, Ukraine, like any other independent country, should have the freedom to choose its partners. And why should any other country uh, have a right? Which, you know, which is, of course, quite... Uh, hypocritical uh, because uh, Pakistan claims the same right in Afghanistan, right? But uh, United States and Europe have never questioned, questioned that. In fact, they were handed over Afghanistan uh, to the Pakistan-Taliban combined. So I'll leave that aside uh, uh, for, 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 for a moment. Then the Maidan protests uh, went out of hand uh, and eventually the duly elected president Yankovic was ousted in 2014 in what was effectively a coup. Uh, and the immediate uh, provocation was that uh, uh, there was a big movement within uh, Ukraine that Ukraine should uh, have a, a trade agreement with the European Union as the first part in the process of becoming a member of the European Union. Whereas uh, Russia was making very attractive offers to Ukraine uh, to remain part of the uh, CIS space. And this became a bit of a, uh, a conflict. And since Yankovic uh, was not in favor of uh, Ukraine becoming part of the European Union and wanted to have a kind of a balanced relationship with both the European Union and Russia, he was ousted if effectively by, uh, by a coup and then sought refuge in uh, Russia. There's also this angle of uh, uh, the oil pipelines of Russia, the supply of oil and gas, 
by Russia to Western Europe and going through Ukraine. That was all right in so far when the Soviet Union was intact. And when the relationship between uh, Russia and Ukraine had not deteriorated to the extent that it has, it did later on. Uh, and this has become a big issue that uh, the Americans and the Europeans uh, at the instance of the Ukrainians and the Poles insist that uh, Russia should not develop any pipelines for supply of uh, gas to Europe which bypass Ukraine because then Ukraine would uh, lose the uh, capacity uh, to, uh, to uh, have influence uh, over uh, these supplies in the sense that uh, apart from the revenue that uh, Ukraine would earn uh, from, uh, uh, from transit of these pipelines, uh, this would also be a kind of a grip that they have uh, on Russia, uh, which explains why Germany and Russia got together and uh, made the first uh, North, South, North, North Stream pipeline, which bypassed uh, Ukraine, and, uh, much to uh, the protests of uh, Ukraine and uh, Poland. And now there is the second North Stream True, which has also been built and is ready for operations. But all that has been held in abeyance until the present situation between uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, uh, is, is, is settled. Uh, now, you, you, you mentioned about uh, uh, Russia's uh, annexation of Crimea. Uh, the history of Crimea, I mentioned very briefly, it was always a part of uh, uh, Russia, if you like, the Soviet Union and Russia. Uh, the population is Russian speaking. Uh, the Crimeans have always considered themselves as, as uh, uh, Russians. Uh, so when uh, Yankovic was uh, expelled, uh, the coup d'etat took place, uh, Putin made the move to incorporate uh, Crimea uh, into, into Russia. But going through the process of referendum and everything else, which they would have won in any case because the population is Russian speaking and, uh, uh, and aligns itself uh, emotionally and politically uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, but it must also keep in mind that uh, Crimea is extremely important for uh, Russia in terms of uh, uh, their uh, naval uh, forces in the, in the Black Sea. In fact, uh, uh, if uh, the Black Sea came into the control of uh, NATO, then uh, Russia effectively will have no Navy left, but the name. So for them, strategically, it's extremely important that uh, the Black Sea littoral remains in their hands. Uh, now, the Donetsk and the Luhansk uh, oblast, as they say, in, uh, in Ukraine also is Russian-speaking and, uh, uh, and borders uh, the Black Sea. And uh, this population has actually declared, th these two uh, constituent parts of uh, Ukraine have declared their uh, autonomy, independence, or what you like. Actually, they've declared their independence, but uh, Russia has not recognized that. Uh, so that is the current issue uh, about uh, Donbass, uh, where uh, uh, the Ukrainians uh, feel that Russia intends to capture more of its uh, territory and incorporate these into uh, Russia. Uh, now, the thing also is that uh, when this uh, first, uh, when Crimea was the next, and this violence broke out between the two sides, uh, you had the first uh, Minsk agreement, which laid down certain parameters, uh, as certain provisions of ceasefire and local self-government and whatever have you, and international uh, monitors coming in to make sure that the ceasefire holds in order to stabilize the situation, didn't work. And then you had uh, the Minsk Protocol after that in 2015, that also didn't work. And then you had the Minsk II Agreement, uh, which uh, is very detailed, which was brokered by France and Germany, um, which uh, has provisions for ceasefire, pull out of, uh, pull out of heavy weapons, local elections, self-governance, amendment of the constitution in order to give these uh, two parts of Ukraine autonomy and self-governance. Uh, in other words, give them the powers uh, which currently are not available uh, to them to manage their uh, manage their own affairs uh, and and the 
promulgation of a new constitution, which would enshrine uh, all these uh, principles. Uh, the Minsk II agreement ha hasn't worked. Uh, Russia claims that uh, the Ukrainians have no intention to honor uh, this agreement. Uh, I don't think anybody has said that uh, Russia doesn't intend to honor the Minsk agreement because if the Minsk agreement is implemented, then in effect, uh, what Russia is demanding would be accepted by Ukraine. Uh, but the Ukrainian government, especially the far right, is absolutely unwilling uh, to cede uh, these two areas of Ukraine uh, and give them constitutional guarantees to act uh, uh, as autonomous units of, uh, of the country. Um, and in the meantime, as you know, uh, the pressures on Russia uh, by NATO have increased. Uh, Putin says that 8,000 NATO uh, military personnel, which are on the borders of Russia, which is true because uh, even the British have stationed 1,000 troops in the Baltic states. The uh, United States has put uh, uh, the anti-ballistic missile systems in Poland, uh, which the Russians say can easily be converted into, uh, into ballistic missiles rather than anti-ballistic missiles. You just have to tweak a little bit and the system can be used also for aggressive uh, uh, purposes. There have been incidents in the Black Sea recently, as you know, where a British uh, destroyer went in and Russia took some very strong action. Uh, the, some, the Russian foreign uh, defense minister has said that they've been flying, NATO has been flying their, uh, uh, their nuclear bombers very close to uh, Russian territory. I think uh, from the Russian point of view, from Putin's point of view, uh, he is of, he's come round to the view that enough is enough. And that uh, he has to raise the stakes uh, for United States, Europe and NATO. Otherwise, uh, this creeping extension of NATO uh, and incorporation of Ukraine in NATO could, as, could someday, when Russia is weak uh, or is unable to, is politically a bit in disarray that this could happen. And if uh, NATO missiles uh, were stationed in uh, Ukraine, then Russia has no defenses left. In fact, Russia would have no defenses left if actually Ukraine became part of, uh, uh, part of NATO. As you know, Americans have started supplying arms uh, to Ukraine. They have uh, troops, they have uh, trainers who are training uh, uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian uh, troops. So now he wants, as you outlined right in the beginning, uh, written security guarantees that Ukraine will not become a member of NATO, that no positioning of NATO weapons in the Ukraine, uh, there will be no military acti NATO military acti activity in Eastern Europe. He doesn't say he doesn't want to rely anymore on uh, promises. Uh, he wants uh, written legally binding security guarantees and a draft document has also has been given to the uh, United States. As you know, they've had a talk on December 7th, Biden and uh, Putin. Uh, uh, and uh, the Americans uh, uh, have agreed to look at the demands, but they've let it be known that uh, the Russians also know that all these demands cannot be accepted. Uh, so where this will go, uh, we, will, we will see. We'll see. My own view is that uh, unless there is some very serious, unbearable provocation from the United States and NATO, uh, Russia is not going to invade Ukraine. They know the consequences uh, of that. Um, it will be, it will actually be a very, very major, uh, major uh, uh, crisis that will erupt in, 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 in Europe. Uh, so Russia is playing hardball and uh, is testing uh, how far the United States and Europe are willing to meet some of its bottom line demands. Uh, we will see. The United States has threatened uh, uh, very severe sanctions, uh, which means also excluding them from swift operations in case they invaded. I don't think that will be that much of a deterrence to Russia, frankly. Uh, they've held up the final approval of Nord Stream 2. Uh, now, I can't see how 
that Americans or the Europeans will accept uh, uh, Russian proposals without some very major concession from Russia. Now, I can't see how Russia will make any major concession because uh, all this while the, uh, the other side has taken steps to corner Russia. There's no more concession that Russia can actually now give uh, to the other side. So therefore, I'm not very hopeful uh, of uh, any solid agreement uh, emerging, uh, but we'll see. Uh, I can't see either side budging easily from their positions, especially as there's very deep anti-Russian sentiment in the Biden administration and in the US Congress. And now if Biden were to yield a little bit uh, on some of the demands of uh, Putin, then uh, uh, he'd be attacked by the Republicans because uh, when they were in the opposition, they were actually making Trump's life most very, very difficult when he wanted to reach out to Russia and have some kind of a modus vivendi with, with Trump. Uh, the issue cannot be, the issue can go to the United Nations Security Council in order to embarrass Russia, uh, but Russia will veto any resolution. So there is no scope for any UN action on this. But India will then have to, in case there's a vote, India then will then have to take a position. Um, now, if I were a policymaker, I would say that uh, India should take it, should abstain and not take uh, any sides. Uh, and we can easily defend, uh, defend this uh, position. There's no question of India being forced to, to take a decision. There's nothing like that. Uh, the, we are not uh, obliged to either side to the point uh, where uh, uh, we will lose our equities uh, with either of them in case we, we didn't uh, take sides. And I'll explain to you why. Let's take Russia first. Long-standing traditional ties of trust and everything else. But uh, look at our, con our current uh, problem with China, or for that matter, uh, the whole history of our relations with China. Uh, today, we've had this, we have, we have Chinese, 50,000 Chinese troops massed in Ladakh, uh, unilaterally trying to change the line of actual control. But Russia is not supporting us. Russia is neutral. Now, this is a direct threat to our security by a partner of Russia. But Russia looks at its larger interests and is neutral. Uh, it, not only that, it is uh, on Afghanistan. Uh, they have, uh, they reached out to the Taliban. They reached out to Pakistan. Uh, they excluded us from some of the discussions they held uh, on Afghanistan. Uh, so it's not as if their policies uh, on Afghanistan and Pakistan are in alignment with us or that they have taken a position uh, in our favor. On the contrary, objectively looking, they have taken a position which is not in our favor. Until recently when they have discovered that the position they took earlier did not work because uh, the Ghani government, the Afghan government collapsed precipitately. Uh, and there's no pressure now on Taliban uh, to have inclusive government because it's just walking. Uh, they have not uh, taken any position on the China-Pakistan economic uh, uh, corridor. On the issue of terrorism, if you look at the joint statements, in a general terms, they're very supportive of what we say, but they avoid any mention of Pakistan. You see the joint statements, Pakistan is never mentioned because they don't want to, again, visibly, openly take sides between India and Pakistan, even on the issue of terrorism when they know very well that Pakistan is the fount of terrorism, not only against India, but also in, in Afghanistan. Uh, now you look at the United States. Uh, United States knows very well that Pakistan uh, has always wanted strategic depths in Afghanistan. They wanted, want India, they want to oust India from Afghanistan. And what has the Americans done? They've handed over Afghanistan uh, to the Taliban-Pakistan uh, tandem. Uh, in total disregard of our strategic interests, knows that this is going to put a lot of pressure on us uh, uh, from the West in terms of uh, Islamic radicalism and terrorism and everything else. They have, they, uh, they have uh, done this. Even now, they don't take any, any sides uh, on India-Pakistan issues. They don't take sides on India-Pakistan issues. Uh, they still reach out to Pakistan. They... they uh, when the U.S. Defense Secretary went to Pakistan early this year, he, he spoke of greater military cooperation with Pakistan. Blinken has been meeting the 
Pakistani foreign minister. Uh, they still believe that Pakistan can be helpful in uh, over the horizon capacity to deal with the Afghan challenge. So they're they are maintaining their relationship with Pakistan uh, and uh, and they're maintaining the strategic autonomy uh, because it's, it, is, it is in their interest. Uh, they still, they, they were in the past uh, actually quite supportive indirectly of uh, Pakistan-China nuclear cooperation. Uh, and, but, now to, but today they're silent. They, a lot of focus on Iran. But, uh, but not on Pakistan. Uh, there's, they, there's no op opposition to the China-Pakistan economic corridor, even though this corridor gives them access to the Indian Ocean and creates maritime issues for both the United States and India and the Quad. Uh, on Iran, they have actually virtually, I won't say, virtually destroyed our relationship with Iran, despite the objective reasons why we should have normal relations with Iran. Uh, there is the whole issue of Katsa, where they're interfering in our relations with uh, Russia. Uh, so it's not as if uh, uh, they can tell us, look, you take sides in our dispute with Russia, but we're not going to take sides in your disputes with, with any of your neighbors. It doesn't work that way. Uh, so therefore, I feel that we have a we should just not take side. We have good reasons to explain our position. We should call for a constructive dialogue. Uh, if uh, there is a imminent danger of some kind of a military uh, situation, then we should call for restraint on both sides. The usual diplomatic thing, which everybody uh, everybody uh, uses as as formulae <laughs> to advise caution on everybody's side and all issues should be solved through process of negotiation. You know, the usual uh, diplomatic uh, talk. There's no reason for us to uh, uh, take sides at all. And uh, we can even offer, if anybody is willing to take up that offer, since we have very good relations with both sides, that we can play the role of some kind of an intermediary uh, where others have failed. Uh, kind of a neutral party like us. Uh, after all, Europe has very tense relations with Russia. Europe is divided within itself when it comes to Russia. The United States has very tense relations with uh, Russia. We have a good relations with both sides. So we can, we can play that role in a limited way if called upon to do that. Uh, and we can offer that and we can explain why our relations with both sides are vitally important and, it, and our relations and our interests are not served by having to choose one side or the other. And although we won't say this diplomatically, openly, because the rights and wrongs on both sides uh, are not clear at all. Thank you. Thanks, thanks to you, sir. It was very interesting and very insightful. Also, I think what happens is that most of the international news that we consume is very heavily influenced by the Western narrative. So I feel like what you just spoke like helps bring some balance to the narrative because what we consume is like a very demonized version of Russia, which is constantly playing mischief and trying to encroach on territories of its neighbors. So it's interesting that you have highlighted some very legitimate sounding concerns that Russia has. And that's what basically Russia has been officially saying that, in fact, we are the ones who are feeling threatened by the NATO forces in our backyard, and this is what we are doing to safeguard our own interests. We are not looking out to invade other territories. So um, thank you for doing that and for bringing some balance to the conversation. Uh, before I bring in the attendee questions, I have um, certain things I found very, uh, very curious about. So like you mentioned, Russia um, has been neutral on India's Indian affairs, uh, whether it's with regards to our issues with China or others, Russia has not really taken a stance either in Pakistan or in China. And um, the popular view is that Russia needs China. It's not the other way around, right? Like people think that Russia is in a is quite dependent on China. Uh, but to what extent is the um, like? are we underestimating um, Russia's importance in that relationship? Because when I think, think about it, China doesn't have any other allies of no, noteworthy allies other than Russia. I mean, North, North Korea probably, but like, doesn't China also need Russia? And doesn't that mean Russia have 
some leverage with china to sort of bring indian issues indian concerns uh with take them up with china at multilateral forums or bilateral forums if they wanted to um not really because uh, it is now quite clear that uh, china has become the senior partner in the russia china relationship uh, you know when the russia india china dialogue started i was ambassador in russia uh, and i could see in that dialogue how russia was the dominant partner uh, this was in 2002 2003 even in brics it was the russian initiative russia was the dominant partner in the sco it was more china uh, and and since then china has become an absolutely dominant partner economically because uh, china has already drawn away the oil and gas from central asia uh, reducing their thereby their potential dependence on russia for these supplies uh, economically they are the second largest economy the second largest uh, exporter the biggest exporting economy in in the world uh, their influence uh, far exceeds that of russia if you look at the totality of the globe uh, whether it's in uh, southeast asia the biggest partners of southeast asian country asean economically today is not japan but it is uh, china uh china is present in, uh, in africa in a big way in latin america in a big way uh, australia uh, is the biggest economic partner of, of china japan is the second largest economic partner of china uh, russia is nowhere there in comparison but on the military front uh, now where... russia russia now militarily uh, uh, china now militarily actually is very strong uh is becoming almost as strong as as uh, as russia uh and and in fact the look at the chinese navy in terms of numbers it is larger than that of the united states not in, not in terms of tonnage but in terms of numbers and is expanding very rapidly uh, russia has never had a very strong navy now you you read about how many additional silos they are building for the intercontinental ballistic missiles and this and that uh russia see the, the odd thing is that the great uh, great uh, image the great success of the soviet union was its its uh, industrialization its industrial capacity uh but today uh, the russian manufacturing has declined uh, abysmally and now they are depending as is most of the other world on china for all manufacturing and they are supplying raw materials Uh, to, uh, uh, to 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 China, not manufactured goods. In some areas, yes, in defense and in the space, uh, they have technologies which uh, they have given to China. But otherwise, so uh, Russia uh, doesn't have that much uh, leverage uh, with China. And if China But, wants to make a concession to us, and I'll end there, if Russia, China wants to settle issues with us, they'll do it directly with us, and not build Russia's stature by giving. part of the credit or full credit uh, to russia they won't do that they 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 want to replace the united states of america as the world's foremost power got it and um do you said that you don't really see the risk of um, actual escalation in terms of a military escalation russia actually invading um ukraine here but at the same time you said neither side is willing to budge so the more likely scenario in your view is probably going to be more sanctions from the west on russia and then russia kind of like remaining um resistant resistant defiant in the face of those sanctions uh, sanctions mm-hmm. and it would probably just create more issues for india in terms of like we'll be violating more western sanctions because we will continue to work partner with russia on defense at least yeah but then uh, you see the point is that uh, the quarrels of the united states cannot be the quarrels of india Uh, we are not dependent on the united states for our security we are not their allies and we have our own vision of how uh, what role we should play internationally yes our relationship with the united states is very vital in fact today our most productive relationship in in various ways across a range of issues is with the united states though of course there are 
so many other issues on which the United States needles us and troubles us and puts us on the defensive, which Russia does not. I mean, Russia doesn't talk about human rights and Kashmir and uh, minorities and CA and uh, uh, what have you, uh, religious freedom, uh, democracy issues, or backsliding on democracy, uh, New York Times, Washington Post, the manner in which they uh, bash India constantly, the Russians are not doing that. Uh, but there are also a lot of positives, very major positives in our relationship with the United States. So it's not as if uh, United States can uh, presume uh, that uh, uh, if they follow unreasonable policies in any part of the world, uh, we are obliged to uh, back them up. After all, you've seen what's happened in West Asia. Uh, what has been the big result from the destruction of yeah. Iraq? Following, and, following them in Iraq. Afghanistan didn't prove great for us. Uh, and, and Iraq and Syria and all that, how it has helped us. They got rid of all these uh, authoritarian but secular regimes and replaced them with the uh, with, uh, Islamic regimes and then the Islamic State uh, uh, got created and uh, the fallout of that, you still feel that in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, no, no, it's, in, it's, it's not as if we are, we are uh, that diplomacy demands, or, or let me put it differently, that, uh, that uh, we, we're not a vassal state of any, of any country. And we have a very big country ourselves. We have very specific uh, ideas about uh, how uh, international relations should be managed. We want to have a greater role in international governance. And uh, we, we have always opposed this uh, unilateralism. We want multipolarity, et cetera, et cetera. And in case there is, like, there is an invasion, how low, how low the probability be? Do you think it would actually well, drive the way? If there's an invasion, I don't think it'll happen. Look, uh, what, a couple of things I want to uh, want to say. One is that uh, when the Soviet Union broke up, 45 million Russians, Russians were left outside the territories of Russia. And they have been constantly discriminated against. They, the Russian language and everything else. If you, if it's not a question of propaganda, Russian propaganda, you can see it yourself. Uh, ethnic issues are very vital. Uh, in uh, if you look at let's say uh, Kazakhstan, the number of Russians when, which were there in Afghanistan uh, in Kazakhstan at the time of the breakup and today, uh, many of them have moved back to Russia or whatever, whatever else. The point is that Russia never used the ethnic issues as many countries use uh, uh, for uh, uh, asserting uh, rights. They accepted. They accepted the breakup. They accepted the uh, the, uh, the fact that so many of their nationals were stranded. Whole thing was done peacefully. They have never attacked any any of the constituent states of uh, of uh, Russia, except except in the case of Georgia, uh, where uh, the two of the I've forgotten the name, two of the districts of uh, uh, Georgia, which again uh, were artificially made part of Georgia. And Georgia was, since I was ambassador there, I know how much he was, <laughs> the Georgian leader, Shakashvili, was encouraged, encouraged to defy uh, Russia and paid the price. And I thought at that time I used to say that haven't, hasn't the West learned a lesson from Georgia and the Russian reaction? So why are they fueling trouble in Ukraine? Ukraine is actually much more serious for Russia than Georgia was. And Russia will react. Uh, so, yeah, I know I was calling out. If tomorrow West Russia reacts, blocks. let's say, let's say they react, uh, the West has no choice. What can they do? Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Like, would they actually go? Would they actually go into a war like with the with Russia over Ukraine? Like, is Ukraine no. worth? Right. Yeah. No. Okay. That. No. No. Like, no. No. They have no capacity. I mean, if they run away from Afghanistan, do you think they're going to take on Russia? They're yes. Exactly. On... Like, no, there is no appetite right now for another war. Uh, okay. And Europe has. Either. Russia has no appetite either. But it is actually tit for tat that you keep putting pressure on us and uh, you, you don't respect our red lines. So this time we are making you very clear, making it very clear to you that we have red lines. And if you cross that, then uh, all bets are off. 
and then you mentioned that we don't owe it to either side which is absolutely fair we don't owe it to either russia or the us that we have to side with them but not siding with them in a situation where there is a actual conflict wouldn't that put into question how reliable india is as a partner for example right now there was all this conversation about bringing india into the five J- five eyes network like would they be able have the confidence to bring india in the five eyes network or any other or even quad like strength if india is somebody they cannot expe- always expect to kind of like But, be on the uh, reliance this begs the question which i raised earlier how reliable have they been so far as we are concerned the the one country united states has uh, targeted the most in terms of sanctions i mean leave side russia during the cold war the one country is india it's only after 2005 that uh, relations have become have, have become much better and are improving and uh, america has become a solid partner uh, in many ways but how have they been reliable Hmm. I think so. In fact, Russia has been far more reliable as a partner than the United States has been. So, how can it be one-sided uh, uh, demand of reliability that we don't have to be a reliable partner of yours? We'll look after our national interests uh, and disregard yours if they conflict with ours. Uh, but you have them to subscribe uh, to whatever we we want you to do. Uh, and if they don't want us in, i don't think this five i is going to happen this just talk uh, there isn't that kind of confidence yet we are not allies of the kind that uh, these anglo saxon countries uh, the anglo sphere has been uh, japan uh, is trying to also become part of the five i i don't think uh, that's going to happen either though there may be partial sharing of information intelligence sharing but that degree <clears throat> of uh, <clears throat> confidence between the intelligence agencies and sharing of vital information day to day with, with large strategic implications not going to happen for the i mean it just can't happen because of our relationship uh, with russia let's say for, uh, how can we part be part of five eyes when a lot of five eyes is directed at uh, at russia <laughs> so that's not going to happen. Uh, yeah no that makes so sense so far as cord and other things are concerned uh, who's going to look after the indian ocean Uh, United States can't do without India in the Indian Ocean. The strongest navy in this in Indian Ocean is that of India's. Uh, United States would very would very much like burden sharing, and it is helpful to us. Let them concentrate on the Western Pacific, deal with China, where they have bases, military personnel, very strong navy, seventh fleet. Let them deal with it. We will look after the Indian Ocean for us, because if they were to look after both the oceans, they don't have the capacity. Okay. Uh, so, therefore, we should not under underestimate uh, uh, the cards that we have in our hand and uh, assume and project ourselves uh, as as a country which needs them more than they need us. Yep. So they need us as well. Let's get um, Tia Singh or Tia Singh. Do you have a question for Ambassador? Thank you, sir. Thank you for that very very engaging lecture. Um. My question is: Doesn't this current debate uh, raise a larger point towards the increasingly diverging interests of Russia and India in the region? Um, would, according to you, uh, Indo-Russian relations become a casualty in the uh, changing uh, great power shifts of the world? Uh, be no. it in talk. No, 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 not really, uh, because uh, our defense ties with Russia. remain strong in fact when putin came here we signed another major significant agreement uh, gatsa would define it as a significant agreement of manufacture of ak2 two or three assault rifles in india uh, we are also going to sign an agreement with them on uh, logistics access as we have with us uh, japan uh, australia and korea uh, and with the uae um, uh, there is this uh, come of 226 uh, helicopters which will eventually be manufactured in india in fact uh, uh, there are about 10 billion dollars worth of uh, uh, defense contracts which are in the pipeline between india and russia uh, we uh, uh, 
uh, Putin's visit was uh, successful in, in many ways. We demonstrated our uh, our independence of our independence of our foreign policy. And the important thing which uh, needs to be noted is that Putin came here, and we talked about stronger defense ties. Uh, when China, when China uh, forces us are, are in Ladakh, uh, it's a message to China. And the S four hundred that we have uh, acquired from uh, uh, Russia is uh, is clearly uh, in defiance of America's GATSA sanctions, and we are, we are willing to face that. And uh, if the Americans are foolish enough to apply sanctions, it will set back our ties uh, on the defense side very seriously. And I don't think the Americans should do it, but let's see what happens. Uh, but look, the area in which we have differences with Russia, which is why uh, there's a feeling that our, our relationship is, a decline, is declining. We have more serious uh, differences with the United States, whether it's on Afghanistan or on Pakistan. And also don't forget the biggest economic partner of China, which is that country, is the United States of America, despite all the confrontation and everything else. Uh, so I think that that would be, uh, I don't think that is a logical way of looking at how things are developing, that uh, the conflict between Russia and, and the United States uh, means deterioration of our ties with, uh, with Russia. I don't think so. Thank you, sir. A uh, small follow-up question. Do you think that um, um, were, if we were to imagine a scenario wherein um, Russia and India, India were to uh, diversify its, um, you know, defense imports and um, uh, rely on other powers, um, would would you see Russia and India ties to be just as strong as they are right now? Well, we already diversify. We have signed about 20, we have acquired about $20 billion worth of equipment from the United States. We have acquired, just acquired Rafales from France. They are building, France is building scorpions in India. And they want to build more submarines uh, in, in, in India. Israel has become uh, a major, major defense partner uh, of India. Already diversification has taken place because some of the things that we need and, uh, uh, cannot be uh, either supplied by Russia or, or they're not of the same standard and quality. Uh, the maritime surveillance aircraft, for example, or uh, heavy lift uh, aircraft, C-17s or PI-8s. The American equipment is superb. Uh, Russia doesn't have matching equipment. So that diversification uh, has taken place, but uh, since our defense expenditure is going up, uh, now the answer would be which that country which then supports defense manufacturing in India, our Atom Nirbhar program, become more and important, more and more important in terms of our defense ties, because we are no longer in the same mode of simply buying off the shelf or doing licensing uh, manufacture. We want genuine transfer of technology. Thank you, sir. Let, let's get um, Manas Vini. Is that the right way to pronounce your name? Yeah, it's Manas Vini. Yes, Manas Vini, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for a very insightful lecture. It was very helpful. So what I wanted, what I was actually wondering was how far would the West actually go, you know, in a sense to help Ukraine, knowing that they may, you know, get Russia as a rival and that may be problematic in any given point of time, maybe in future or somewhere. So how far do you think the West may, can or will go? They can't make uh, Ukraine part of NATO out of the question. Uh, Russia will not accept it. Yeah. And uh, in case, yeah. uh, I mean, we are talking hypothetically now. In case, in case they took the decision to make it part of NATO, Russia will move in and take a, take over all the eastern part of Ukraine. And uh, will I don't know what they'll do, but uh, they can even, I don't know, maybe possibly overthrow the government in. Uh, in Ukraine, I, I I don't know. That is hypothetical, but certainly uh, there'll be very strong react reaction by by Russia. Russia won't accept it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. But you are assuming that the West will be foolish. Well, I hope they will not be. What well, what is their interest in making yeah. Ukraine NATO? What is their interest? 
Why do they? Why do want? Why do they want to poke Russia? Mm. You know, the, the the Americans couldn't tolerate uh, Russian missiles in Cuba. Why not? They 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 still can't tolerate Russia's uh, Russia's relationship with Venezuela. Why not? So. Uh, Um, yeah, I mean, it's a similar kind of concerns India has when China tries to uh, build up military infrastructure, naval infrastructure, and India is core backyard as well. That makes perfect sense. But I want to, you had earlier talked about Baltic states, um, and they have already joined the, the, the NATO, right? Mm-hmm. But, 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 but the general, the narrative given to us is that these are free democratic states, they want to be part feel secure because right next to them there is Russia, which is for Italian. So do you draw like a big contrast between the Baltics, the situation with Baltic states versus Ukraine? Like is Ukraine... Yes, because Ukraine uh, historically is very much part of Russia. In fact, the Russian state first emerged in, uh, in Kiev. But the Baltic states were incorporated uh, by Stalin. Uh, before the uh, in the lead up to the Second World War to have a buffer against Germany. Uh, so to that extent, uh, uh, when they were when they were incorporated, uh, the West never recognized their incorporation. Uh, legally, they never accepted Baltic states as part of Russia. But nobody ever said Ukraine is not part of the Soviet Union. Uh, so the uh, the situation is is, is quite different. And do these Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, do they also have a significant Russian uh, diaspora living there? People of oh, Russian yes. descent. And okay. Yes, and they have discriminated against the Russian language. Uh, they've done that. Uh, but the Russians are reasonably well integrated in, in some other ways, as I understand. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, for example, all the monuments that were built during the Soviet times uh, as uh, uh, to honor the those who fought against Nazi Germany and defeated Nazi Germany, uh, the Russian generals and everything else and whatever, they've all been uh, destroyed in the Baltic states because they say, no, no, the, 